what makes young people raise the race. I'm curious what makes you so curious. What makes you so curious. In the beginning was the beat. Welcome to the Rape Curious Podcast. I'm your host, Joshua Glazer. Uh, What are we curious about? We're curious about electronic music and the culture that surrounds it. And how do we satisfy that curiosity? We do it by talking to some of the people who have dedicated their lives to the electronic music scene, the DJs, producers, promoters, and more. My guest on today's podcast is DJ Sneak, one of the giants of Chicago house music. He's also become known over the past few years as one of the most outspoken advocates for old school DJ culture, at times seeming to wage a one-man Twitter war against the agents of EDM. I asked him about that, obviously, why he's felt the need to speak up and at times start beef with some artists in the EDM community. I think part of me kind of hoped he might start some more beef on the podcast, although as we were talking, I, I kind of realized that the podcast is not really the best platform for initiating beef. I think it's, uh, you know, Twitter definitely has the market cornered on that. And, and a lot of DJs have learned to use it as a platform by which to convey their opinions, sometimes opinions that rub others the wrong way. But everything on the podcast did stay pretty civilized. But yeah, that is that is coming up. But before that, I know I'm a bit late on this, but this is the uh, the first podcast intro I've recorded since the horrible events in Orlando a little over a week ago. I'm not going to try to say anything new or profound about what happened. I'm just going to point out that you know over the last few years, there's been a real emergence of a gay underground scene, especially here in America. And, and it's done a lot to remind us about the, uh, the gay roots of the music that this podcast is all about. Um, personally, I have a lot of friends who are part of the, uh, the gay community, and, you know, specifically kind of this you know, new underground gay techno scene that's been getting a lot of press attention. But, you know, and, and it's been really amazing to see electronic music culture, which is something we all love, and the gay culture which, you know, this music was in a lot of ways invented in gay culture, but then for a long time, gay culture didn't really have a lot to do with this music. And after, after several decades, it's, it's been really a beautiful thing to see gay culture and today and the electronic music culture of today kind of reconnect and relink. It's, it's not to say that gays make better music or that, you know, you have to be gay to make this music or, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not even saying that you necessarily should use the word gay in front of a dance music artist just because of their sexual orientation. There's, there's a lot of artists out there who, who don't need to be categorized in, in such a way, but there, there are also a lot who are using their sexual orientation as part of their art and are identifying as such. And, and those people should be celebrated and and look, I'm I'm not even trying to apply that Pulse nightclub where the shooting took place was was a musically underground establishment. As far as I know, it actually was not. Nor am I saying that the type of music that was playing when this awful event occurred should have any bearing on um, you know, on how we feel about it. You know, I, th- I think my point is that you know this music and this culture. Uh, both historically and and more recently, has brought me as a cis white male closer to gay culture, and and for that I am grateful. Uh, I'm also grateful for the contributions gay culture has made to this music that we all love, and mostly I just I'm empathetic to all of my gay friends and colleagues for whom this tragedy has felt extra personal. I think if one good thing can come from this horrible incident outside of the larger conversations of gun laws and mass shootings and terrorism and homophobia and Islamophobia and kind of all these seemingly insurmountable issues is, you know, one thing people keep talking about after Orlando is the importance of clubs as places where people who are, you know, be the minorities or people who are just exist outside the cultural norm can find themselves. And maybe it's only, you know, when we suffer a loss like this, that we appreciate what it is 
that we have to lose when these sorts of safe spaces are compromised. Clubbing is more than just pointless hedonism. It is art, it's culture, it's community. It's all things that are important to us as humans. And it's sad that it takes a, a tragic event to really put that into focus. But I guess one good thing we can take away uh, from all this is that it's been put into focus and we should not forget it and we should appreciate it. And on that note, here's my conversation with DJ Sneak recorded before any of any of this uh took place in orlando uh enjoy we were just talking before before i turned this thing on about what's going on with beatport yeah you know for those for those who are tuning in a little later, I'm not sure exactly when this will come out, you mm-hmm. know, next month or two. Okay. But, uh, but just yesterday, it was announced, uh, you know, a big round of layoffs at Beatport. I think they, they said 48, 49 people laid off. Yeah. Um, and this, the, the plan is to contract the, the business, go back to the, the core business, just, so the, the, basics, the, just yeah, the MP3 yeah. store. Um, and you say, you know, this is something you've been talking about for a while, um, just kind of, you know, predicting the, uh, I don't call it the fall because it, no, the, the 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 bumps in the road because sometimes um, people take chances and opportunities and uh, you know they might see things one way and might end up another. In the case of as of facts, you know it's um, it's weird how everything is just upside down right now. Mm-hmm. But it was a bit weird when I heard that they sold Beatport. You know what I mean to a company like as because um, as we all know the EDM bubble bursting or exploded I don't know what the hell's happening with it but you know it's um and with that I, I would I would think uh, companies like that would would take a fall too you know what I mean it's not like the stuff in Europe mm-hmm. like uh the US is not educated as at, uh in clubbing and festivals like like Europe you know it's been 20 years ahead man yeah no I mean like it's interesting because yeah Europe to, to the best of my knowledge there, there's not a real there, there's not previously been a model where the actual like market like actually right. like full on corporate and that's you know they have those in America they have those in Europe hmm. you know I, to my knowledge there's not an example of where the business went that far yeah in, into the corporate realm before but I mean like Europe did have you know a bubble and and a burst in like you know yeah. late nineties early two thousands. I mean, maybe maybe what's happening is good because then they can restructure and, and, and focus on really what they're really good at. Mm-hmm. And if they go back to just uh, being a, an outlet for music and not get so distracted with everything else, like everything else, then maybe they get back to, to, to then moving forward again mm-hmm. or moving up again or partnering up with somebody else or whatever, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, where there's like, there's, there's this kind of, Shot and fraud is not the right term because it's not like people are like, but there's this little bit of like people love to see a, a fall, mm-hmm. a little bit. Certainly the SFX people love to see a fall, but they're they're not really connect. They're not they're not relating you know yeah. that to the fact that you know real people and not just real people like real people whose hearts really are yeah. you know true to this are the I ones mean, that most people ultimately really take a hit. Don't don't really know the real story or the full story of of, of the owner of SFX and. You know the things that he's done and accomplished and bought and sold and this and that and that. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? So it was just after that whole Electric Daisy thing. You know, they kind of got everybody excited in Vegas and they was called, well, let's go and invest this and let's get Stock Martin, let's, let's get some New York money, let's get real investors in this thing. It's the next big thing. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? And and now whatever it's facing out or I don't know. I don't know where it's going right now. Actually. Mm-hmm. Um. We'll see what happens, man. I mean, I think uh, I've been more on, on thinking on, on a different sort of way of distributing music and everything else that, that, like, for example, I do for my brand and my my music and my labels and everything, you know what I mean? But more of direct, uh, direct to fan, you know what I mean? I think Dirty Bird Records is already doing it. Um, where they have sort of like a members program, 
Mm-hmm. And they have their their amount of followers. They love their that are like diehard Dirty Bird kids. You know what I mean? So they just make it easy for them to be like, cool, join this, da da da, and then you have all this at your disposal. You know, for joining or being a member or whatever. And I think that's sort of like the way things. Whoever could do that route, it'd probably be beneficial for, for them mm-hmm. if they really know what they're doing and. They can expand many different ways, man. Merchandise is huge, you yeah. know. Um, whatever, music, selling an MP3 is is not the thing anymore. I think it's like over because you can get it for free. So get them on something else. You have a brand; they love your brand. They're gonna buy a T-shirt, mm-hmm. and that's that's more money than an MP3. Well, that's that's always my thing, and, and I think I've, I've probably said this on the, on the podcast before. But I remember like 15 years ago. Going to a ghostly international party, yeah. and and Sam Valenti, the the founder, was working a merch table, yeah. And he had he had American Apparel Girls underwear, yeah, which is like a little ghostly logo, yeah. like on on the hip. I, and he I'm, just he just said to me, he's like, he's like, can't download panties, bro. That's it. You <laughs> know what I mean? It's like, it, and it's something that's physical that people can take, right. which is like you know, it, it's not what the people are not used to that anymore but some people are into the collecting and, and supporting their artists and whatever so this is where the fan and the and the labels and the artists can be just just one to one here's here's the one thing that concerns me about the one to one and this is you know partially a real concern and partially me playing devil's advocate mm. and is you know you're you're a record store guy you were a record store guy yeah. like as yeah. you know gramophone yeah. as, as real as it gets yeah and part of you know and like you know I in Detroit, I come from Detroit, where we had yeah. record the dance room at record time, same yeah. deal. And it's like, yeah, you still have your favorite labels. You have, you know, you're, you're gonna, you know, uh, you know, relief records, you buy on site, plus eight records, you know, buy it back in the day, yeah, sort of thing. But once you're in there, mm. you're exposed to so much other stuff. There's like, you like this, then maybe check out this, or what's this, you know, what's the guy, at the counter it's, playing, all it's that. It's a beautiful it, thing that is that is missing, man. I just went to Grandma from last month, mm-hmm. and. I like to go on Mondays because there's, there's nobody there. <laughs> and I could be there for three hours and just check out whatever. But it reminds me of when I used to work at the the original location just down the street. I mean, it's it's like a barbershop for DJs, you know what I mean? And, and that's what that was for a lot of people in, in the industry and, and people from Chicago. People, I mean, there's different stores everywhere, just like in Detroit and, and New York and stuff like that. Um, that... That was what made us sort of kind of a DJ or or upcoming artist was that relationship, that interaction at the record store. And you heard information, oh, somebody did a, an edit of this or a remix of that or, you know, if you like this, come here, I'm going to show you and play you some more stuff and get people who are interested in, and even other music, even, even if they weren't interested in what you had to say, there was customers there that if they're walking around for my, more than five, ten minutes, I just approached them and be like, "Look, what do you like? Mm-hmm. Tell me what you like, and then I'm gonna help you. I don't work this area, but I'll help you. Yeah. You know what I mean? And the interaction was what actually people appreciated the most, and they remember that. They'd be like, "There was this big dude, Carlos, and he helped me, and whatever. You know, it wasn't his thing, but he still hustled to get me whatever I wanted from from the record store." Yeah, and, and I, 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 wor- I worry that might go away if it becomes strictly, like, label to fan interactions, mm-hmm. because then it's you're, you're only getting what you already know. You're already get it's, it's a, a singular cur- curated thing. But, but I'm curious, so, like, like when, you were, when, you, when you were at Gramophone, like, like, were you the nice guy at Gramophone? Because, like, record store <laughs> guy, I remember, like, you know, the, the first uh, ten times man. I walked in, uh, I walked in, like, record time. Yeah. I was, you're, you're, it's, it's an intimidating experience. Okay, but then so, the first time, like, someone's cool with you. Yeah. So check it. The, right. the first four or five times I went to Gramophone as a customer, mm-hmm. they treated me like shit. They were like, who the <laughs> fuck? Who are you? <laughs> they didn't care, you know what I mean? And yeah. it was, but it was a, it's not that they didn't care, because they did care. It was just that there was a lot of things happening in the smaller store, too. And there was a lot of drinking and drug taking and it was like free man you know these are owned by um, a gay couple an ex-military dude <laughs> who we we, we always we used to bug out because we'd be like how do you how do you guys partner up you know what i mean because charles was like 
straight business. Yeah, and then, and then Joe and and Doug were like the the people who dressed up the store and the people who welcomed you and made you feel good about being in that store, you know. But it worked, man. I, um, and then honestly, I kept, even though I kept reject, kept, kept getting rejected, I was interested because they had good mm-hmm. records. It was just like nobody would help you out, man. And mm-hmm. eventually. You catch somebody and be like, dude, can you can you just like help me a little bit? Just point me in a direction. And somebody might actually feel sorry for you and be like, all right, come here. <laughs> and then, you know, I was a, I was a, always a big a big dude. And um I worked at other record stores as well too, you know. So I had a bit of people knew who I was but they they didn't make a big deal and I wasn't like DJ Snake by this point. I was just Carlos from the hip house going to the gramophone store. I worked in two two stores at one. And um yeah man, gramophone was uh it's it's a hard one. So I'll tell you what, years later, after working at these other stores, I ended up there and I took a a salesperson job. I could have been a manager because I managed another store mm-hmm. and I knew how to do a lot of other jobs and stuff. But I was like, no, I, I just want to sell. I just want to sell records. That's it. Mm-hmm. And I get my discounts. So I can buy my own records. I was very straightforward, and they were like, cool, and they love me and whatever. So, and they knew that I had, I can interact with people and get them interested in stuff. So, like, the the very special days were like Friday and Saturday. Um, Gramophone ha- still has a huge gay clientele, and for the club DJs. Mon- uh, yeah, Saturday mornings was the the shift. So between nine and twelve, all the gay club DJs would come, and they want that New York house, that deep house, everything, you know. And I was like, I had to learn to uh, sell to everybody mm-hmm. and be really open. Like, hey, man, how are you? Do do do, and learn because I was learning at the same time, man. I was I was slanging records and playing stuff for people and. It wasn't like, here's 10 records, go listen in your station. No, it was like, come here, I'm going to play to you live and talk to you about it. Mm-hmm. And who did it and who produced it and who touched it and who played it and da-da-da and what, you know, all that stuff. Yeah. And people love that stuff, man. And back then, it was actually a lot fewer records. <sighs> back there, I mean, <laughs> I, mean, I, I mean, I used to, when I used to get on a record, I, I would make bets with my boss and be like, I'll sell you 100 copies of that record this weekend and be like... There's no way. And I said, okay, you're on. You buy me lunch next week. That's like that scene from uh, that movie. He bought me lunch <laughs> so many times. <laughs> After a while, he'd be like, whatever, fool. Just sell the records, you know? Mm-hmm. And it was good. It was a good, it was a good era. I mean, it... Uh, and this is what? This was like the yeah. like mid-80s, late-80s? No, this Early is... 90s? For me, oh. this was in 90... Uh, 94... Between ninety four and ninety six. Okay. Oh, I see. Yeah. I didn't realize you were you were still working gramophone that late. I, I was um, I was at the hip house between eighty nine and ninety four. Okay. And then I took a break the whole summer, and then I took a part time at, at gramophone. So when did you start? I mean, because I, I thought, and you know, things are a little fuzzy. Mm. I, I thought by like ninety four, ninety five, you were, you know, out every weekend DJing. And I was. You, okay. I was, but I was also working the store. Going back. Okay. Yeah. I loved it, man. I came from a true. Uh, hustling of, of records, man. You know, I when I believed in something, I pushed it. You know, I ordered 50 records of Elias, Follow Me, nine months before anybody knew that fucking song of six. You know, like, I'm sorry, I curse. No, no, it's, 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 it's perfectly cool. okay. okay here. Yeah, man, so, sure. uh, and I was pushing it every weekend, and my, my bosses would be like, return those damn records. You're never going to sell them. <laughs> There's 48 of them because you bought the only two copies. And I was like, I'm going to sell this goddamn fucking record, man. <laughs> and then just like that, one weekend, Bad Boy Bill rolled in. And he, we were cool because I used to sell so many of his hot mix tapes in the store. And I was like, Bill, you want some hot shit? And nobody's up on that. I guarantee you if you're playing the radio, they're going to love you for it. And Bill's like, cool. And I had played on this record probably four or five times before. <laughs> <laughs> and then I was like, check it out, man, right here. Boom, boom, boom. And he just like, all right, give it to me. Went home, make the mixes. Next day I sold all of them, dude. Mm. All of them. That was the that was like that, man. It was it was magic. I will I will I will never cease to be amazed by and this is my ability too. Yeah. To listen to something 
five times mm. and be like, just blank, just mm. nothing, just flat line. And then on the sixth time, like something, did he know it was your fifth time playing it for him or? No, I never, I never told him. Right. Because okay. he used to, he used to come and be like, I got 15 minutes. And while he was like dropping tapes and collecting money, mm-hmm. I was in the DJ booth. You like this? Yo, you need to play this. Yo, you need to play this. And then it became a thing where he, he used to invite me to his house and, uh, Usually it was like Wednesday and Thursdays, and he would make four mixes for the weekend at B96 in Chicago. So two for Friday and two for Saturday. And he was using reel-to-reel and cutting reel tape and making edits by hand. So, you know, after a while, it would just come with like 40 records from the store. And whatever he liked, he played. Okay. And then I would take the other stuff back to the store. And then if he played it, I already knew that I was going to sell a certain amount. So I was like really on with with a few DJs like down in Chicago. I think that was that was something that it took us a long time to figure out that these these radio DJs and these radio mixes mm. they were really like doing it like in the studio. It was it was man. I mean now you use Pro Tools and computers, but like Bill was doing it with reel to reel and reel tape, marking you know cutting. It was like incredible to we see. We thought he guy. was doing it with two records and a mixer, and we were no, like, no, he, "What is going he on?" He was, but then but he he got then into you'd... doing quick edits. Mm-hmm. And he loved playing, you know, 16 bars of a record and then phew, mixing to the next mm-hmm. one. And to do that, you had to have either a four-track recorder yeah. or or he just did it with Real to Real. And, like, he loved the Real yeah. to Real, man. It was, like, it was amazing to see somebody do that type of work and put that much work into it. I remember the first time I found out, like, when Jeff Mills would do his Wizard mixes. Yeah. And, like, basically, he'd record, you know, he'd, he'd do a live recording with two yeah. turntables. And yeah. then he would take that recording and do another live recording over it. Yeah. I was indignant. Yeah, because yeah. like, well, people just got you creative, were picture, man. Picturing this guy with four arms, <laughs> like how is he doing yeah. this? Or like, or like, yeah. what kind of what kind of special records does he have? And it's multi layering, but I mean, the stuff he was playing mm-hmm. was allowed him to do that stuff. The music had a big part of, uh, on that on that d- development and evolution of a of a DJ that can think in multi levels. You know what I mean? And not just like one track or whatever. Just, just open up and be like, I'm gonna do this, and do, 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 and he'd be one of them, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I think in a way, there's some of even like the more mainstream. Whoa, <laughs> think they'll fall on us? No. So, so some of the more mainstream stuff now, it is in a lot of ways like almost like hot mixes. Yeah. What what some of these guys are doing with like you know bad yeah, like you said, bad, but, bad bad hot mixes. Let me tell you. <laughs> I came from the era of like having. Tapes, man, like tapes and mm-hmm. beautiful, beautiful things that people put together. You know what I mean? Just with what they have. Sometimes with only with two turntables. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? It was like that. People were so into it. You know. Now is uh, it's a different ball game. <laughs> yeah. What what ball game is it now? Uh, let's say uh, who's the most popular? Who can who's got the most likes? You know, who looks a certain way. Mm-hmm. Not necessarily who's got the most talent. You know what I mean? Or who put the the time to to get to where they have. You know what I mean? It's really one track mind. I see DJs use laptops and be like, not mixing. <laughs> or mixing with no headphones, no nothing. Just like, hey, I'm playing this track next. And then I'm playing this track next. And I'm playing this track next. And every DJ sounds the same. Mm-hmm. So the... The club vibe actually has changed too, because there's, there's there's not that many people who take risks anymore. You know, when I see like Jazzy Jeff, I go crazy because he he's an amazing DJ and he shows it and he's like using also uh, the computer and all that yeah. stuff. But he's he's a Serato guy. Right? He's like yo on a next yeah. level. He's he's mastered that. You know what I mean? The program while most people use it at the most basic level, just to get by and act like they're doing something right yeah. yeah i mean some of these guys like with the with the controllers and the you know tractor and maybe you know like two turntables and everything else it's like yeah. things you could never could never conceivably have been done live mm. um mm. but you're you're you were never that kind of dj you were i never touched it man i mean i'm playing right now with usbs mm-hmm. and i still buy my records and whenever i can play vinyl i play vinyl but usbs is convenient and when i have to play 80 shows and in five months, mm-hmm. it's convenient. 
You know what I mean? So, but it's a lot of work too. You got to keep up and you got to clean up and you know, take all the doubles and all the crappy stuff. So it's like, you know, I prepare as I would with records, actually. I just make different folders and put things. If I'm playing a specific festival or a specific club that I know like likes a specific sound, I give them a whole folder of that and then add a bunch of stuff. Like, I'm going to play this on top. You know. So how do you how do you decide when you're giving them what they want? Like you're kind of like preparing for a specific club, but how do you decide like where the line is where it's still you and not not it's, what, it's just so, what they want? You know what? It's always me because I always come with with the stuff that I know how to do best, and I, I'm I stuck to Chicago house music since I got into it. I've never took a diversion just to stay in a certain status or blend in or be part of a certain clique. I've, I've, I swear like I've lasted two or three tornadoes by now mm-hmm. in the last 20 years of the change-ups in music and styles, you know? And, and just the music that I've, love and respect has always kept me connected with the passion and that, that's always given me the drive to continue, right? So it's, I don't know, man. DJing is uh, I don't know. It's corny. It's going to sound. But it's a way of life, man. You know? And, and I live that shit every day. Even when I sleep, I'm, I'm freaking mixing in my head. Mm. Or I'm having a moment or whatever. In yeah. terms of a crowd thing, I, I, I put folders. I don't use I don't even use record box. I just use the bees and I'll stick stuff that I want. And uh if you see me play, it's uh, the most unpredictable. That's what you're going to get, the most unpredictable, because I'm actually not. I know I have this music here, but I don't I don't have an order mm-hmm. of which that music is going to go together. You know what I mean? Until it's happening. Yeah. I would say on one hand, like, it, it's, on one hand, it's unpredictable. On the yeah. other hand, you know exactly what you're going to get. Because yeah. you, like you yeah. said, you, but sometimes you, you stuck you, with this very you clear. You go place, and, and if you're there and you, you happen to hear the last four DJs before you played, and you hear the, what they were playing, and you're like, well, I don't want to play this, and I'm not going to play it. And then you just go there and you just play something completely different and blow everybody away. That's really what you want. And that's really what the crowd wants. They want to be, they want to be pleased in a way that they're also challenged to understand what you're playing for them. You know what I mean? Not just... Not just be like sheep and be like, well, this sounds cool or this is a hit and I know it because I heard it a thousand times this week, you know, on the radio. So it's, yeah. All right. So so you're here you're working on an album, which I was frankly, I was very surprised to hear. Yeah. Like, oh, Six in L.A. making an album. Yeah. Like, what, when was the last time you did an album? Fifteen years ago. Yeah, that's what <laughs> I thought. That's And I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll tell you a little story because I always got to make this podcast a little about me. Mm. Um... You, one of the first, when I first started writing, you know, interviewing DJs or whatever, you were one of the first people I interviewed. It was a quick phone conversation. Okay. Like 99, 2000. Okay. Um, and you were talking about doing an album. Yeah. And you were like, you know, it's going to be, it's going to be dance music, but I also want to have some down tempo. I want to have some of this, some mm. of that. And I think that was, that was the first moment where like, I kind of hung up the phone. And I was like, if I have one more motherfucking DJ tell me how their album is going to be dance music, but not all dance music, yeah. but like you know what I'm saying? Like yeah. that was it was yeah. such like a, a thing that it's people because would... people people sometimes don't want to be associated with what they play or mm-hmm. what they. You know how many albums I hear of people who are supposed to be dance music and it's really not. It's some other music, and then when you when you hear them play, they play a different style of music too. You know what I mean? So. I don't know. Some people don't want to be associated with what they sort of where they're standing. Sometimes, you know, that's my. <laughs> now we got the junk hair dog. I got the junk hair, but yeah. Um, this album actually is. It's probably twenty years of DJ Sneak. Street life experience, you know everything that I've learned in the last twenty years. So does and, it? And does a very uh, in a very educated, mature way. I don't know. It's funk. It's soul, it's house, it's, it's street style, it's everything, man. You know? But it's really, um, it's really um, special, man. It's really the best, the best stuff I've, I've, I've been part of of, of, of of putting together. You know what I mean? I got a team of people. Not mm-hmm. 
20 people. You know what I mean? I got a few few people, but very strong, who, who work hard and who put in the time and who have been able to actually let me open up and become also a different style of producer as well, too. You know, I'm, I, I've been a lot... A lot of people say, oh, man, you like DJ Premier or like house music or whatever. I heard that a few times, and that's great. But I want to be something else than just DJ Snake. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So this, I'm not changing, and I'm not, hey, you know, I'm not, I'm not flipping back on where I came from or whatever. It's very much in this project. But uh, it took a while to, to get back to work with, uh, you know, this guy who's sitting next to me here. Uh, he's a black Black Cat, Mark Bell from Blackpool, England. He helped me in my first album, the, the housekeeping album, oh. Fix My Sink and Funky Rhythm and all that stuff. We did that album in Blackpool and, and the cold. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, and somewhere very different than L.A. And now he's he's living here. And I've always loved L.A. I played here for 20 years. Sure. I knew there was something special here in L.A. And I loved funk. And I love soul, and I love '80s funk, and all that stuff. And it's here. It's like when you're driving, you're hearing it, mm-hmm. and you're soaking it, and then you put it in the studio. Man, it's pretty crazy. So, what what made you decide now was the time that you know 15 years go by? Maybe the the fact that good music is actually needed in the industry, and I, and and I still have knowledge that maybe. Is is yet to be revealed in, in in this industry that we're in. You know what I mean? Like the fact that I, I there's there's a lot of stuff out there I don't really vibe with, and mm-hmm. there's a lot of stuff out there that makes no sense. In, in what way? In, in what way is no sense? It's just generic. There's okay. a lot of generic stuff. You know what I mean? And copies of copies and whatever. You know, I I like to hear something new. I like to be trying new things and whatever you know challenging usually is is the word that i use i want to be challenged and challenge myself to try other things you know and try working with different people you know, whatever so i hear i hear a lot from from a lot of people and and you know, like like matt edwards you know radio slave has made a real effort to, to yeah. fight against it and other people that like there's there's tons of music right now mm. but no one's really trying to make hits like not hit not top 40 hits but like you know underground hits like you know you had some records you know i i, I honestly I, I forgot about fix my sink but like yeah. you you heard that record every weekend for two years yeah. like that was a you know an underground hit and it feels like like no one's trying to make those anymore are you are you, tr- because are you trying to make don't those know. people don't know people don't know how to make those set of records man and my whole new album and new project is I, honestly, I have too many tracks. I don't know how many are going to end up. But it's all that. Imagine, imagine like, you know, 15 or 18 or 20 tracks. is not like Fix My Sync, but of that quality. Mm-hmm. That's what I'm trying to deliver now. That's what's there. Simmering and shit. Okay. Just waiting, yeah. So is it, when you say people don't know, I mean, I don't know how you don't know. Yeah. Like. No, I mean, there was, there was, look, man, there was a whole generation that skipped giving a shit about the how everything started or the legend or the the pioneers or the godfathers. There was a whole generation that said, fuck all that shit. I don't care. We're going EDM, boom, boom, boom. And then now there's another generation popping up that actually wants to know and wants to experience and wants to hear certain DJs play. Mm-hmm. Kerry Chandler, Doc Martin, Derek Carter, Mark Farina, old school names that... They've been around for 20 years, you know, now they're resurfacing and, and they're getting stronger than ever. I, and then mixing with a bit of everything else is out there. You know what I mean? Yeah, I just saw Mark is doing um, 25th anniversary of Mushroom Jazz gig yeah. coming up here in L.A. Yeah. And I was just like, I, I don't even know how I feel about like, I'm ready for 20. Like, I've accepted like things being 20 years old. Yeah. I don't know if I'm ready to accept like 25. things being 25 years old. We used to, we used to pick up his tape. Mm-hmm. That series on tapes, mushroom jazz on tapes. Yeah, and then it became a thing, you know. But I mean, he's he's blessed, man. He's got a good ear, and he loves. He's a true record um, slayer, and 
loves music and all kinds of levels too, from down tempo to house to yeah. whatever. He's he's one of those guys. Like I, I feel like I he kind of came up, went off my radar for a little bit. Yeah, and I think I think he you know, pe- people, you know, at various points got to focus in, focus out. Yeah. On, on no, what I mean doing. he's he's straight relevant in, in the U.S. mostly. Mm-hmm. Um, he has a huge following in, in Japan for the mushroom jazz stuff, and then. Um, Again, you know, when when everything starts changing musically and everybody goes back to f- fucking underground music, mm-hmm. right? Then they come back to the OGs and say, yo, we want some of that OG shit. Yeah. So everybody else gets to hear it. And then maybe you, you, you plant some new little seeds so then that next generation picks up on what we're still laying down. Because we're still here, man. This... There's a lot of people out there who are really... I'm not the only fool that gives a shit, man. There's a lot of DJs that really care about shit. Especially about the music, you know? But then there's a lot of other DJs that don't care. They just do it for whatever reasons they're doing it. I'll tell you who, who just came kind of back on my radar in the past year. With a killer mixes up on his SoundCloud. Hmm. It, of new stuff is Terry Mullen. Terry Mullen. You know, like... Yeah. like he, he, he's, he's you know, been very upfront like yeah. on social. You know some of his, you know some of the reasons why he had to go away for a while, and yeah. you know he's still struggling with a couple things. But he did, man. I, but he, I know he he's had, in Denver now, and, and he's doing pretty well now. And yeah. you know he went to some rough patches and whatever. But people find themselves, man, and and music. And he had the record, like, yeah. like that guy had the records, like that. That he's he the reason why I discovered the basement time jacks, records, like yeah. Yeah. you know. And then and I, I go. We, we kind of reconnected because I, I did a Where Are They Now piece yeah. like two years ago. Right, right, he was right. one of my people. And and then he's like, here's my new mix. Check it. And I was right. like, I'm thinking like, this is probably just going to be a bunch of like old Terry Mall records. Like, no, yeah. it's like, I don't know Brand any of these records. Fresh stuff, yeah. No, it's good, man. For me, um, for me, something similar, they just, were you, something similar to what mm-hmm. your story is saying is that, um, what's with Doc Martin? Mm-hmm. who I love him and my bro and we played together and we smashed many years in Europe and then he got sick and it took him 10 years to kind of come back and and now he's getting a bit of shine again you mm-hmm. know what I mean and now he's I had that moment with Doc like three years ago I heard a mix somewhere and I literally picked up the phone and I called him and I was like bro I, I know this, there was a bit of disconnection there while mm-hmm. all that transition, all that things were happening with him, you know? And then when I heard this mix, it was like, and I only heard like a one-hour part of it, and he had a four-hour freaking session of it. So I downloaded the whole thing, and I literally <laughs> called him on every track. What track is this? What track is this? What track is this? Give me this track. Give me this track. Like, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And then eventually we reconnected again, and now, like, man, he's... He's killing it, man. He's killing it. He's so focused and he's so so good with what he's doing. And for me, for somebody who's 50 years old, an old school DJ, and somebody who, like, loves what he does, you know what I mean? It, it, it makes me proud that that dude's still doing it, man. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And that when I see people like that that I know from 20 years that are still on the grind, and some had to drop out because they had to get real jobs because everything was crazy, you know? But some are stuck to it. They're stuck to it. And those who stuck to it are now starting to get more momentum because the music and the, and the, industry, and the scene has changed to, to house music again. Yeah. You know? Yeah. One of the things that I love is there's this whole group of, like, Detroit DJs, like, you know, mid to late 90s Detroit DJs who were just my friends mm-hmm. who never played beyond, you know, like you know, opening for you at a party. I mean, Chuck Daniels, right? Is like, you know, I know you guys have been down for a long, long time, and it's we like, we had our we had our time. I don't really talk to him. Anymore. Oh, really? Okay, yeah, okay, cool. But but the, there's but, a lot of people. There's a lot of people in Detroit. <laughs> I got I got mad love to you know. So it's been good for the last few years. I've been playing for the movement and when mm-hmm. I've established some really great relationships there and in, in Detroit. It's one of my favorite places, you know. But yeah, you know, there's a lot of guys. For example, that have come up through the things, and and when Mark or Derek or I show up, they get to open and play, and they love that man. Yeah. But now some of those guys are getting a headline, like they're they're right. getting their first headline gigs overseas, yeah. And they're almost forty. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. I'm 46 now, man. You know what I mean? Like I've been I've been grinding hard since 
I remember probably around 24, 25, that's when things took off. That's when mm-hmm. I had to go to Gramophone, the boss, and be like, Joe, uh, I need more time off. He's like, look, man, this is your graduation, <laughs> and you got to go. Yeah. And we love you, but go and do this thing that you have to go do. And, and man, that was great. That was great. That, that, that's, that's, that was the changing point in my life, and that person telling me that was really great because I loved the store, right? Yeah. So what about like like do you remember like the, the your first trips out like your first kind of big tours your you know going around like what was do, do you have a moment where you you kind of feel like it happened probably one of the first trips that I went out mm-hmm. uh, the very first trip I had was Mexico City of my first international gig so I actually left Chicago and left mm-hmm. the USA and landed in Mexico. That was one of those, that was a party that I'll never forget. You know, and it was like a huge house in the middle of Mexico City, maybe about 1,500 people. Oh, wow, okay. All dressed up in, like, fairies and neon and peyote and mushrooms and <laughs> weed and tacos. And, I mean, it was crazy, yo. I remember I graffitied the party. I graffitied, like, I do graffiti, too, so sure. they gave me some yeah. spray, and I sprayed in the walls and... And this was somebody's house, you said? Yeah, it was, okay. it was like a the back of this massive house who had like a wow. ravine and it had these two massive trees. It, and then the thing is, like, you know, you look all around Mexico and everything looks like it's stacked up, but this house had this this big ravine in the back. It was some magical shit, man. Mm-hmm. And then, but that wasn't that was like my fun thing. Like, wow, this is amazing. I'm gonna do this shit forever. <laughs> <laughs> I was like uh, enjoying it, right? So that, uh, then, then. Maybe four or five months later, I get, I get two bookings in Tokyo, Japan, and I find myself down there, and that's when the that's that's when that moment happened. I was playing some 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 club on the seven or eight floor of a building, two thousand people, just had fresh copies of Kenny Dope the Bomb, Bucketheads, and I was. You know, doing the tricks between mm-hmm. whatever. And I had been playing more released out, kind of tech house, techno, mm-hmm. booty house and all that shit because I knew they, they loved, like, techno at that time. They're talking about 1995, May 1995. And then I I dropped that and it cut into the house thing and then I went into a house set for the rest of the night and they were screaming their ass off, man. And then, then I was like, okay, well, shit, if I can make it all the way down here to Japan and I could do this shit, then that's that's it. And then I never looked back, man. So, yeah. so, this so was Tokyo. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Eye opening. You know, when you're like a big, giant dude like I am, I'm 6'2, <laughs> uh, you know, 320 pounds, and I look like a sumo wrestler, and everybody else was like three <laughs> feet <laughs> around me, and there was like 2,000 people mm-hmm. crossing the street at the same time, and I'm standing there like, this is this. I was really. Yeah. That's when it hit me right there, man. Yeah, you 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 are an imposing figure, yeah. even from the DJ booth. Like, yeah, you know, you you don't you don't need big lights and and, nah, and LEDs. I mean, like, like people can actually see you up there. Yeah, I'm big. But, I'm big all around. Man. And you, you kind of got your like like you. you I remember um, just dropping in one of your sets at uh, an ADE a few years ago with uh, with a friend of yours, uh, Z from Toronto. Yeah, and, yeah. And yeah. I remember like you you were. You like you had lined up like you had you had you had your Swifts lined up, yeah. You had like your Coca Colas lined up. I got drinks. I got riders. Like, I got everything lined up. <laughs> but I've never I've never seen it done with such like precision. Yeah. Like if it, it felt. Well, like, I mean, I've been doing I've been doing it for for a while, man, and and now it's come to a point where I'm I'm the most comfortable. Mm-hmm. At what it's like, you know, somebody who does, who's, after a while you get good, man, mm-hmm. and you like things a certain way, and you say, look. Turn the lights down and and just put a spot over there. Keep it this level, so then I can just come with the music and then we can bring yeah. it up. Don't be all sh- flashy and I hate that kind of shit, man. You know, what I mean, sometimes I gotta play in those kind of clubs too. And usually I tell the light guy, you know, a lot of guys don't even just take the time to go go walk over to the light guy and say, hey man, how are you? Having a good night? Shake his hand. Can you like you know keep it cool for me? Have a two second conversation, man. You know, and they love that shit. 
then they give you what you want. Then they feel like they're part of the performance. Of course, man. You know, like I, I do this a lot in Ibiza, and I treat all the staff that's behind the scenes who's helping me have that moment when I'm gonna perform to have my my time and do my best performance. Those those are the most important people and people behind the scenes, man. And you go and greet them and whatever. You know, like there's a lot of a lot of people that don't don't even look sideways, man. You know. Mm-hmm. So when you're when you're nice and everything is nice and everything's prepared, you have the best time, though. Yeah. So wh- where's your spot in Ibiza? Because I remember I was there two summers ago, and you yeah. were supposed to play with Mark. Yeah. And it it it, it didn't happen. It didn't happen because I was I was staying with uh, Mario J from Toronto. Right. And like right, he's right, like right, he's right. like we were gonna go and like the party got canceled and then like yeah no I'm right now like where I'm staying or like, like where where are you playing when you're down there? Right? Well, now I mean the, the last. The last few years, I focused on Ushuaia with Ants, as, which mm-hmm. is a local night, uh, playing a space with Carl Cox, and um, sometimes different events that happen in space. This year, I picked up We Love, because they're, they're mm-hmm. closing with we, we Love Space on Sundays. I'm playing with um, Bob Sinclair with Pasha this year. I'm, you know, I always find I pick up more gigs, you know, I, I got set gigs, you know, for the summer, and then while I'm there, I scoop up a whole bunch of other ones. Because you're because you're living there, yeah, man, solid for the four months, bringing yeah. bringing the family. Like a few years back, I was the right place at the right time, and I wanted to do a party at Ushuaia, and I had requested for Snoop Dogg, you know, for them to pay for it, and then um, and they were like, you know what, Pete Tong's doing a party with Snoop Dogg, but we'd like you to open up for him. And I was like, shit, that's good. I'll take mm-hmm. that gig, you know what I mean? And that happened by being there at the island. You know? yeah. So, I mean, you know, I'm playing everywhere, I'm touching everybody, and I actually more focus on the European, like the, the festival circuit and uh, and all the other places that I can get to from Ibiza, which is really easy, you know, hour and a half, you're in Milan or Rome or two hours you're in London or Amsterdam you know you can get from anywhere there man you know and in the summer you can you can get lucky sometimes you can jump in people's private jets <laughs> <laughs> be like hey can you give me a ride here and then drop you off and shit so but mostly um it's it's just a base you know I'm not I'm not in into anybody's little clique there you know what I mean and I played the field for many years I've been playing Ibiza since 1996 every summer I play the best parties already. <laughs> um, I'm just still, you know, representing the music and and actually I, lately I feel like I'm one of the only American DJs out there that that really puts the shit down because everybody else is European. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? They they focus mostly in European talent. I guess that's true. At one point, okay. it used to be Roger Sanchez, Morello, mm-hmm. all that stuff. And now it's like, man, all European. Yeah. So there's Dub Fire. There's Richie, who's Canadian. Yeah. Mm, and I don't know. There's I guess, not, yeah. There's I'm not trying that to many think. US. Like, there's other people that go in and out, but. Yeah. yeah. But I, it's funny, I had I had, uh, I had Eric Morello on the podcast mm. not, not that long ago. Mm. Um, he's out here in L.A. now. Really? He's like... Or he's got, like, some huge mansion with the... I like to move it, move it. Yeah, that's what I was going to say, dude. Like, it's... It's that, yeah, it's that to move it, buddy, is... <laughs> no, it's... um, you, uh, you see it from any pretty much anywhere in Hollywood. It's like, there's the Hollywood Bowl. Yeah. And then there's the Hollywood Bowl scenic overlook that's above the Hollywood Bowl. That's his house. And then, above that, <laughs> is, is, is Eric's uh, balcony. It's, it's... God it's, bless him. You know what? I wish him well, man. You know, he... He he's really worked hard and mm-hmm. he's made some bad choices here and there too. Yeah, but n- and nicest guy. I, I'll, I'll know, be honest with you. I did not know like he was not someone I had ever met. Yeah, and he was not someone who I had followed since you know early two yeah. thousands or whatever. Yeah, yeah. I did not know what I was walking into. And yeah. yeah, I mean he's definitely you know been through you know been through some stuff and That's is it, very man, open know? about it, very honest about it. Yeah. We talked about it a lot and yeah. you know. It's it's a hard it's a hard life, man, and you can get caught up on, on stupid things, you know. If you don't, yeah, um, I'm glad that I've been able to stay mostly drug free. I smoke weed, and everybody knows that shit. But really, I never um, <laughs> I never put anything up my nose ever. You know what I mean? And I think because of that, I keep my brain still functional. Yeah, 
what, what I found, what I thought was really interesting about Eric's story, yeah, is he was he was drug free until the mid two thousands, yeah, and it was actually kind of the rise of EDM and that sort of mid career malaise yeah. that I think a lot of you know a lot of you guys went through. You know, he did, you know, Sanchez did, like a, a lot. Yeah. There was there was definitely a point like the early to mid 2000s yeah. where it was real questionable if you could be a superstar house DJ anymore like that was just not really a construct I mean, that was existing would, they, they, and that's where that's where he got insecure enough to try to start self-medicating they weren't prepared to what the other mm-hmm. wave which was the the next generation who was getting who was getting prepped up by the same clubs and the same agencies and saying mm-hmm. okay we're gonna we're gonna blow you up on Eric's night and eventually you're going to push Eric out of the fucking way and it's going to be your night. And mm-hmm. you can do whatever you want. I mean, you know. Is that a specific example you're referring to? I don't, I don't that's know. Pretty, the... That's pretty much what, has, what happened in Ibiza mm-hmm. after 20 years of like American DJs having their nights. Right. And then sort of introducing other talent. Eventually the newer talent replaced the old, mm-hmm. the old stuff. You know what I mean? And Eric took it really hard. Eric has a... He's he's competitive and he's a, he always likes he's a little guy, <laughs> you know. Not to say whatever, but he's, but he's fiery, a little guy. Fiery, and, but he's a, he's yep. always got something to prove and mm-hmm. he's always want to be number one and all that stuff. And yeah. it's it's really hard to 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 get your ego crushed sometimes, you know. But you have to check your own ego, man, you know. And 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 Roger Sanchez has done it, and Morales has done it, and a lot of people now. And so. The ones that get to go and play and showcase and whatever, they're grateful to be playing out there. Do you think, you know I mean? and, and it, have there been times when, because you've been very confrontational at, at certain <laughs> points. See? <laughs> yeah. There you go. <laughs> Call my you dogs know, out on you, man. With, with, <laughs> with some of the, the new generation. Yeah. Um, look, Looking back, you know, with a little bit of clarity now, a little bit of distance from it, because yeah. I, I don't think you've, I don't think you've, you know, had a Twitter fight with anyone for for a minute. Was it was no. part of that ego and insecurity on your part? I, I suppose, man. I mean, I definitely got a huge ego too. But it was more like watching people take a shit on something that I fucking loved. You know what I mean? And when mm-hmm. I saw this shit happening all the time, I was like, "Fuck you! I'm not gonna let you take a shit on the shit that I love. I'm gonna fight for it." And then, I, then I became the black sheep. Then I became the fighter. Then I became the outspoken old man. But look, mm-hmm. if I go and fucking play next to these fools, I'll eat them up. I'll take them to fucking school every day. You know what I mean? It's not about the talent anymore. You know, but whatever. Now I've gotten past that shit. Now I'm be like, okay, you're all generic. First of all, you're not cool. Mm-hmm. Your whole fucking techno uniform. That everybody wears out there and whatever, it's not cool. You know, Berlin's not just the only fucking cool place in in Europe. There's a lot of cool places in Europe. You know, so I got him past that shit, man, you know. But it was it was definitely like I had to call out a few people because I seen the shit and after you see it two, three times, you get it bothers you, man. Mm-hmm. It bothers you. It's like if you do something that you know you're fucking passionate about and somebody fucking next to you is just doing it because he's a fucking dick or he, because he's somebody's cousin or he's the club owner's son or <laughs> things like that. You know what I mean? And they, they all of a sudden re- try to replace you, then, then it bothers you in a way. You know what I mean? But I mean, whatever, whatever. I'm, I've been quiet because I've been busy working. I've been mm-hmm. quiet because I'm speaking with the music now, as I should be, you know, because um, I think I've had a great career and good reputation. Maybe Twitter is not for everybody. I definitely abuse Twitter because it's a way to get fucking heard, man. You know, and that's why it's there. DJ Dan, who I love, who's like my brother, he tweeted. Somebody fucked up when they gave tweet <laughs> Twitter to sneak. Mm-hmm. Because then I was like, oh, people are actually paying attention? Cool. Let me just say some shit, you know, because nobody's saying nothing. Because everybody's licking each other's asses and being buddy buddy with everybody and not being real about what what's happening sometimes and that's why the whole industry is all a bunch of monkeys and shit happening man you know what i mean and and the real talented people never get through anymore so me as one of the ogs i just be like cool i'll talk 
and I'll back the shit up. Though. Yeah. I mean, I got to admit, like, like cause I, I wasn't really on the Twitter. And then when I started this podcast, I yeah. was like, okay, maybe this would be a good outlet. You know, maybe Twitter would be a good outlet to, yeah. to engage. And you know, I started, like, a Rave Curious profile. And, I, I, yeah, I, I, I kind of had to poke poke the bear. I had to, I had to like, yeah, tweet something at you yeah. within the first week because it's like, well, I'll get over yeah, that. <laughs> Look, man, it's a way of interaction. You know, like, I, I, I'm not stupid. I, I'm, I learn and I evolve with everything. And, and technology has allowed me now to be in the game, maintain my, maintain my playing field, you know. Mm-hmm. And, and at least if I'm the only one swinging a the bat, then – I'm swinging it for the right reason, you know what I mean? And there's, it's not just an outlet for everybody else to use and, and abuse, and then you don't get whatever. I, I knew what I was doing when I was getting into Twitter, Twitter beef sometimes with people. And, and I, sometimes it looked bad on me because it looked like I was being idiotic and whatever. And I made it, you know, some of the shit I said I shouldn't have said. But then if I don't say it, then nobody else is going to say anything, man. So you know what I mean? It's like you're going to get me regardless. I'm not going to sugarcoat the shit because I'm going to make somebody else's feelings feel better or feel whatever. No, if you're insecure because I tell you that your shit is whack and you can't really play or your whole style is like whatever and you're phony or whatever, then their insecurities are the ones that kill them. You know what I mean? Like I just, I just say it, man. Sometimes I just have to pull the curtain and let people see. I don't have to like go and attack anybody anymore. Yeah. I just be like, you know what? What do you all think about this? And then open the curtain and then everybody jumps in. Ah, you know, I know how Facebook and all that shit works, man. I know people don't look at the stats and all that crap, but I do, man. You know, I'd be like, you look, I can say some stupid shit and get this, like the shit will peak. It's a megaphone. You know what I mean? For two yeah. days, it'll be like, shut <laughs> And everybody's talking about it, and then every, all the blogs are talking about it, and then they start copying and pasting all the, and whatever. And, you know, it's, it is what it is, man. But at least people know that I mean business, that, you know, if I say something, it's my opinion, and everybody has their own opinion, and my opinion is not the best one or the right one. It's just my opinion. Claude, it's like Claude, Claude Young posted something on Facebook today. Yeah. And, you know, Claude will get outspoken, not just about, you know, yeah, the business, I, but about everything. We support and, each other. He, and he, we support each other mm-hmm. online. And yeah. he said, he's like, he's like, he's like, you don't have to, you know, you can like my music without liking my opinion about something. Yeah. And he's like, he's like, and I don't, this is why I don't accept every friend request. Mm. So maybe it's better if you don't know all my thoughts about everything else. That's it, man. You know, I, I'm... Just, just put it this way, man. I've, I've learned to tame the animal, but the animal is going to come out once in a while. But right now, it's just all about good things and good music and feeling great and having a, a third win in my career and feeling like I'm, I've accomplished something really good here in L.A. And now that I'm, like, I'm leaping, I'm leaping from where I'm at to somewhere else, bro. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But I'm still going to be the same dude. Awesome, you know, and that that that's as real as you get right there, right? All right, you know. So, <laughs> so two, two two requests, and we'll, yeah. we'll end this. Can we can we can we stop this? Because I want to I want to hear some of the new record. Yeah, for sure. And man. would you follow me back on Twitter? <laughs> if you ask, nice. <laughs> if you're a dick, you can get blocked because <laughs> I do <right>. it. <laughs> no, you know it's uh, that's funny, man. I think you might have followed me and blocked me already. It, it could happen. I, I think that might have happen. happened. It could happen. You know. It's, <laughs> You know when I block people is when they start swearing because I don't, I don't really like to be fucking fuck you fuck off. I, I don't do that. You know what I mean? Know but I you know, wrong. and and sometimes people can say the wrong shit <laughs> on the wrong day and catch me in the wrong time, and I'd be like, what? But then you know that's that's part of personal therapy of just saying you know what you're bigger than this shit. You know what I mean? So mm-hmm. block it and just keep going. Don't feed into it. Don't jump into it. Because a lot of these dudes out there, they're just fucking jealous too, man. You know what I mean? Like, they're not, not everybody likes me, and I don't expect that to, to happen. But there's a lot of people out there that don't want to see a motherfucker succeed and be successful. 
And the shit with me is that I, I've been on the road, man. I've been on that path. No matter what, I've been on that path. When people changed, I was in the path. When they had to do a full circle to come back to the path, I was in the path. You know, so they have to respect that shit, man. And and that all come that all comes into play. You know what I mean? That all that all comes into play. All right, stupid. <laughs> Thanks, man. That's it for this episode of the Rave Curious Podcast. We'll be back in two weeks with more conversations with key players in the electronic music community. Uh, if you like what you heard on this podcast, let us know. You can give us a shout on Twitter at Rave Curious. You can also like us on Facebook, Rave Curious Podcast. And of course, subscribe on iTunes to make sure you never miss an episode. Uh, that's it. Thanks for listening.